Mirka Hokkanen is a mom, a full-time artist, an author, and a military wife who travels from one country to another. She juggles her time between illustrating, creating her upcoming books, and homeschooling. Apart from all of these artistic responsibilities, Mirka somehow still finds the energy to teach and plan for her exhibits halfway across the world. I had to interview her to find out how she does all that. So join us today as we talk about goal setting and why it is a twofold endeavor, a technique that will help you ace your animal illustrations, why you don't need to wait for inspiration to come, how important narrative and storyline is to your art piece, and an insider peek at her life as a military wife and an artist. If you want to be part of the conversation, then send in your questions and topics you want us to cover to hello at etcherlab.com. Hey, this is Jesse from Etcher. We believe in your power to create, so we invited artists from all around the globe to inspire you to keep on creating. Join us in this journey and let's celebrate creativity. This is Make More Art, the podcast. Someone who is attending your class for the first for the first time, we would like to know how you started. Have you always been creative as a kid? What were your influences growing up? And why did you end up doing watercolor? Um, well, I think I'm just one of those kids who just, you know, as soon as they could grab a crayon and draw, they would draw. And I never stopped. I just loved any kind of, but I was, I wasn't really, you know, it was just anything I could get my hands on. I would build outside with sticks and stones and I would, you know, draw in the sand and whatever I could get my hands on in the house. I would, you know, I would, I would use and, and make art with, um, and I would, sew like my grandma had a little scrap closet with fabric that I was allowed to just go in there and cut stuff. And, you know, from a very early on, I would just sew little animals together, um, and so I've just always been kind of a maker mm -hmm. and I think the water, you know, watercolors are just kind of one of the earliest after like crayons and color pencils, like you usually get a set of watercolors and, you know, you start in kindergarten. And so I, I've been, you know, you, you get into that. And then my mother got me kind of a nicer set of watercolors. I think I was around 10, 11, something like that. Um, as a birthday present, because I was really, you know, into art and I did, I was kind of an introvert kid and I didn't have a lot of friends. So I just spent a lot of time at home drawing and painting. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think I was, I was looking at some of the paintings that I've done when I was about like 14 years old or something like that. And I remember like pulling out, we had, my grandma had this big book with uh, animal, like animal encyclopedia. And I would paint my favorite animals out of there. And I remember telling my mom that we needed to go, there was a little teeny tiny gallery, like on actually like on the block where we lived. And so I told her like, Hey, like I, I, we need to go over there. Like I'm going to be an artist and I want to have a gallery show of my artwork. Like, do you think that like, I was just convinced you know, I was just a little kid and I was naive and I just thought like, of course they're like, my art is gorgeous. Of course they're going to show my art over there. And, and, you know, it was a little, you know, it was little kids, watercolors of animals. And obviously we, we never even opened the doors of the gallery and went in there, but like from that very early, early on, I, I already kind of saw myself as an artist and, and that was kind of what I did best. I wasn't really good at math or science or I, I liked stuff, but it wasn't like a strength. So I, I did horseback riding. So I was thinking I'm either going to do something with horses or I'm going to try to do something with art. So that was kind of my two things. Wow. So ever since you were a kid, and I'm, I'm really fascinated because you're surrounded by people who are very supportive as well. Um, mm -hmm. I believe probably they saw the potential um, that you are into arts and you did mention that you're not very well you didn't say not very good but you're not very much interested invested into like math or sciences but more on the creative side mm -hmm. so what do you say because when I look at you first and you did mention as well in your about me page in, in your um, website that mm -hmm. you were painting drawing animals mm -hmm. Where did that fascination come from? Was it because of, you know, the environment that you grew up in? Or was that the early stages of watercolor that the first subjects that you started um, painting? 
Uh, I think it's just always been me. I've just always been interested in art and animals and nature. And I've never, maybe it was because I was an introvert. I don't know. Or I always related to animals and I always spent a lot of times outside and, and observing nature and observing animals and, and, you know, animals are usually friendly or, or they'll ignore you, but at least they'll kind of never hurt your feelings. And, and so I don't know, I, I just always liked animals and, and, and they're just cute. And, you know, when you're like, I had a whole bunch of stuffed animals when I was a kid and, you know, you just want to take care of them. And like, I, I never liked dolls or Barbies, but I was all about my stuffed animals and taking care of uh, feeding my stuffed animals and toting them around and taking them for walks. And so I, it, 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 I think it's just the way I was wired that I've never been really into drawing people. It was always just animals and nature. I love how you do animals. And, and I was going to mention as a caveat, because yeah. you were saying I was always supported by very, you know, I, I've, I've always had people who supported my art, but I did have the normal parents who did not think that art was a career. And so my mother did make me take a whole bunch of math and science classes. And she thought, you know, yeah, you could, you should, you know, my parents thought you should have some kind of a real job and then the art can be on the side as a hobby. But um, I ended up just kind of going a different way myself. So I would like to say it's not a just the other way because you're really good at what you do. And aside from illustrating, so animals, right? You started off with animals and you said that you were never really, I wouldn't say good, but um, of course you have sort of like the go-to subjects. And for you, those are animals, not really portraits or mm -hmm. have you tried florals as well or no? Um, a little bit, but I think the animals are just more interesting. And I feel like we relate to animals in like, personally, I, I related more to animals than I did florals and so when you're especially when you're a little kid maybe the flowers aren't as like I like picking flowers and I like looking at flowers but they weren't really as interesting to draw I think but you know there's always something about drawing animals in the eyes and their souls and the way you either reflect yourself on them or you know your relationship to them and and there's so much symbolism and so I feel like there's just so much there and it it never becomes boring at least for me it's a really good perspective on drawing, illustrating animals because I, I do watercolor on the side as well, but mostly florals, uh, mm -hmm. florals and uh, I tried my hands on portraits, but never good at it. But I haven't tried animals, and there's always this feeling that it's very difficult to to draw or to paint. Even what is your take on that? I mean, for you, it's it's always been your fascination to draw and illustrate them and your perception of how they its symbolism and the way that you relate to them and how you reflect yourself on them mm -hmm. through your works but for someone who's starting out and probably thinking you made it sound so easy but for someone who's starting out any tips that you can share I, I remember someone talking about like start with shapes was it the mm -hmm. same for you or did you have a different technique of Right. Yeah, def definitely the same. And I feel like also if you're just kind of starting out, if you're thinking about comparing people to animals, like people are like way up there. People are hard because we're wired to see faces. And like, if there's something not symmetrical or something's off, like we immediately see it. But if, if it's an animal, I mean, do there's so many different shapes and sizes. And, and so if you're drawing a dog or a cat or a bird, like it, you don't have to be a hundred percent like on the dot with it for it to still look good and for it to pass. And so I feel like you have a little bit more, it's, you, you can take things a little bit more, I don't know, liberty with drawing things. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be, and I feel like floral is the same. It doesn't have to be, yes. you know, yes. a flower can be so many shapes and, you know, maybe a caterpillar ate a corner off of it or something, you know? So I totally agree that shapes is definitely the way to go. So when I start drawing any kind of an animal, you know, you just reduce it down to, you know, arches or straight lines or circles and squares and triangles. And then, you know, you get the main kind of lump of it on your paper first, and then you start getting the little details and kind of molding it from there. And, and that's kind of how I, how I build my animals. 
So in, in a very simple way like that. That's a really good tip about shapes. Um, thank you for validating what I've heard and read. Um, I've tried it and maybe I was doing it wrong, but probably I need to watch some of your tutorials, which we already have on the Etro website and already mm -hmm. we'll talk about your classes in just a bit. But I'm also interested to know, because I am, I'm, I was looking, viewing your feed and your works, and it has evolved um, through the years. What were your influences with the style that, um, that you're doing for, for your work, especially for the books that you have published? Is this, because when I look at, I'm, I'm looking at your works right now, it's very distinct. Um, you have this certain style that is really perfect for children's books, like illustration books. So when did you realize, what is that turning point um, in your art journey when you realize that this is the type this is the style that I would want to pursue and illustrating children's books is my way forward mm, that's a tough question I feel like over the years ever since I started school people always told me that you should be illustrating children's books and I think even even when my style was different and because I feel like my my I usually always had some sort of a story in the back of my head that I was kind of illustrating anyways, but I always felt like I couldn't come up with I, I wasn't a writer. So like even though there was like a some sort of a backstory or the characters were doing something in my pictures, I I never felt like I was able to kind of come up with the whole story on my own. That that was a that's kind of a very recent development mm -hmm. where I figured out how to actually write stories. Um, and I don't know, people just always said that, Hey, you should do children's books, but I always felt like it was a really hard, really hard kind of a field to get into. And I, I, I went to school for printmaking. Yeah. And so yeah. that was, you know, what I did for years and years and years, even after school for about 10 years, um, I, I showed up galleries and, and did art fairs and stuff like that. And so I think, I think what happened was that I, you know, you get older and, and time is starting to run out, but then also, so it was kind of a, you know, many things coming together at the same time. And so at that point, I, we also had two kids and I, we were going to the library every week and bringing, you know, home like armloads of, you know, 20 books at least a week. And so we were reading a ton of books, buying a ton of books and, it just kind of, kind of finally felt like, you know, if I'm not going to do this now, then I'll just never get on that train. And as far as then the style, I don't know. I, I feel like I, I do kind of several different things. I do kind of a more realistic thing. I, I can do, you know, more realistic paintings, but then I can also do more simplified you know, very blocky kind of mid-century modern inspired um, illustrations. So it kind of feels like, and actually, cause I have two books that are already out and I have two series that are coming out and all four of those book series, none of them have a, the same style. Like some of them are watercolor, some of them, are, one is printmaking and two is going to be digital, but even the two digital books are completely like different styles. And so for me, I feel like the my the project that I have the style comes the style serves the project so kind of I feel I, I read the book and I figure what the book needs and then and I kind of tailor my my own aesthetic to that and I think there's kind of palettes that I gravitate towards um, but then as far as style I feel like there's so many <laughs> I have so many styles I don't know. I don't know if there's one that's a real me. I think, I think it's just, I like to have humor and I have kind of, I kind of gravitate towards specific palettes and, and maybe that's what, that, that's what, you know, people recognize. But if you, if you lay down all my four books that will be out by the end of next year, they don't look like they've been done by the same person as far as I'm concerned, but some, somebody else might be, you know, feel totally different. I guess from an artist's perspective, you can easily tell that huh, this this is so different from what I have done prior 
and what I was doing, so publishing this upcoming books in 2023 and 2024. But when I look at them and I face them side by side, I know that it's yours. And um, well, I'm kind of relieved to hear that, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but I also would like to, to touch on, because you, you, you said earlier that you were not very good at telling stories. But one thing that what's interesting about your words is they do tell a story. So the, the narrative, um, you, you, you said this earlier, that you already have this story at the back of your head and you translate it into your illustrations. How important is story in art or let's say in, in every piece of art that an artist does? How important is the story that we're telling for each art piece? Um, well, I think that's, you know, that's going to be different for every single artist. And, and I think it's, you know, different. And then whatever my story is as an artist, the person who's looking at my art, their story might be different. They're going to read something different with it. Um, so I, I think it really varies. For me, I feel like, like I, I will, I'll do stuff that's more decorative and that's just pretty and it matches your couch. And I do have that kind of art too. And I, I don't know, my art, it, it's been kind of in, um, I feel like I've been in a, in a little bit of a shift definitely in like the last five or six years, because that's kind of when I've been turning into more of a children's book illustrator versus just a fine artist. So when I was just a fine artist, my, my artwork always had that kind of story behind it. And it was kind of important for me. And part of the, the, I don't know. I don't want to say like, and especially, so this is maybe a tip if you're just starting out. So when, when you're an artist and you have to have an exhibition or, you know, you have a show coming up, like it's going to be really hard if you're just trying to like pick up ideas from the sky and, you know, I'm going to paint this and then you have to start all over again and think, what am I going to do for the next piece? I, you, you know, if you need 30 pieces for a show, but if you have a storyline and you have a theme for the show in the back of your mind, then it's really easy. Then like everything just automatically like kind of comes from there. And so in that sense, it was always easy for me. So if you had the, if I had the story in the back of my mind or what the idea was, the theme for the show was, then it was really easy for me to then create the artwork that all kind of matches with that theme. And, and that was really how I, I worked for years, you know, decades, I want to say. And then now when I started children's book illustration, I also started learning how to write and that my first, just as when you become a, you know, do you decide you want to learn watercolors? Those, you know, the first watercolors that you do are horrible the same way when my, the first stories that I wrote were just absolutely awful and they were not publishable at all and so in the last six years I've wrote I don't know 20 stories I've had you know hundreds of ideas and I've wrote a whole bunch of stories and we finally sold several but I but it in but at the same time it changed the way that I was then making my fine art and so now that I'm putting a lot of effort into the children's books and that type of illustration and a lot of like the standalone pieces that you'll see like on the front page of my website, they'll, they're kind of just illustrations that I'm thinking like for my children's book portfolio. But then like, but then when, if I, cause it takes up so much of my time. So if I do have time to do like actual just artwork, artwork that I have a show coming up in June and I have to come up with something for that. Um, but I feel like, I don't want to say I'm burned out from the stories, but I, I feel like for the fine art that I do now, I want that fine art to be kind of more decorative in a way. Mm -hmm. And I want to put a different type of an energy in it. I feel like that I was putting into it like when I was a fine artist, it was, you know, it was more serious and, you know, there's an artist statement and I feel like now that I'm doing children's books, like I'm like, you know, kind of whatever, not whatever, like I still take it seriously, but like, I just feel like there's more of a lightheartedness. And if I just want to do something for the joy of doing it and I, and I, and for that, 
you know, if I feel like it looks good, you know, I, I like the way that it looks. And even if it doesn't have like that serious art gallery, you know, art, you know, whatever story behind it, it's, it's, I feel like somebody can enjoy it just as much as if it was that very serious artwork from a very serious artist. And so, yeah. so now I feel like, you know, now like, let's just have fun with art. Let's just enjoy it. And then that joy will kind of shine through whatever you do. And so it, it, it's, I have a different way of, of viewing my artwork now that I did, you know, six years ago. I love that part that you share that you are more, it's more freeing and you find the joy of doing not whatever, but it's like, like you said, mm -hmm. there's some lightheartedness. And of course, the, the, the fine art, um, the one that you, where you post, uh, when you publish your works in a gallery, that's different because it has a different mm -hmm. scene. But now you found this niche children's books where you can freely express yourself and have fun with it. I was waiting for that word uh, when you were sharing. It's like fun. And I guess um, that's a really good tip as well. And about, especially for someone who's starting out, not to be too hard on yourself when, you know, mm -hmm. when making art. And that's very visible with how you are coming up with the designs and the story in your children's books. You talked about... Um, exhibits and you have one upcoming in June you said mm -hmm. and what's interesting about you as well America is that you travel a lot so I was wondering how do you manage to find the time to prepare for an exhibit um, I know you have an Etsy shop as well and you have kids all the while managing moving from one place to another can you share a little bit more about that um well it it it's definitely an art of its own. Um, I've, we've been doing it for a long time. So in that sense, I'm already kind of used to it. My, instead of, you know, working on very large pieces or canvases, I work on paper and I work on small pieces. And so, you know, my presses and, and the kind of all the tools that I have, everything's kind of, you know, very compact and very small. And so, everything can kind of come with me. And so we, my husband is military. And so every time when we do move, the military comes and packs everything up and then they kind of dump everything in a house and you have to kind of sort through it. Um, so in that sense, maybe there's a little bit of help where I don't have to like pack and like put everything in a, a truck and then, you know, undo, but in some ways it's a little bit more stress because they just show up and pack your whole house in a day and then they dump it out in like a couple of hours on your doorstep. And then, so I don't know, some, in some ways it's not, but I think kind of just the, I don't know. I, I, I just have a drive and I can't help myself. And I just, as you know, if, if I don't get that creativity kind of out of me, then it gets really pent up and I get kind of, I don't know, angry or, you know, I, I, I'm not as a nice of a person. And so I just kind of need to have that. It's like my, yeah, it's like my way of just letting go. And, 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 and I feel like my, I'm myself when I get to be creative and, and do stuff. And even if it's just knitting or, you know, if I don't get to be in my studio and draw, I, if I can knit or so, you know, that, that can be just as creative for me. And so, um, and nowadays, because things are digital, I have my iPad. And so even if I, my whole studio gets packed up, like I'll usually have like a little sketchbook and my watercolor set, and then I'll have my iPad and I can still work kind of wherever I go. Um, just using like my children's books are, I can illustrate them partially through, you know, procreate. And so everything just kind of, I've made it so that everything kind of travels and, and comes with me wherever we go. And so somehow we just make it work. I don't know. And it's absolutely what, like what you said, it's an art in itself. Moving from one place to another, I just can imagine um, moving from one place to another in short period of time, doing exhibits, um, managing your Etsy shop, managing your your kids at the same time. I'm sure it, it takes a lot of energy and mm -hmm. effort to do all of these things, but you still manage to do all of them and do teaching on the side as well, <laughs> which is amazing. And um, I know that, so the two books, so you've already published two, is that right? And there's two mm -hmm. more upcoming. 
Um, these are yeah, I have three more. Well, four more upcoming because mm -hmm. I have three coming in 2023 and then one in 2024. And, and there's going to be probably two more in 2024, but I can't talk about that yet. Okay. I was, I'm just curious to, to know, because you've been moving from one place to another and for, for a number of years now. In, in your books, are there any influences of your travel? I, I know like when we moved to Hawaii, I did feel the need to have like more color in my art, for mm -hmm. example. So because, you know, everything in Hawaii is so bright and, you know, the prints and the nature and everything is so bright over there. So even though I didn't change my subject matter too much, like I made a few little things that were Hawaii related, but in general, you know, I, in general, no matter where we go, I kind of stick to myself, like. My, to my to my like own path so because there's no point for me to all of a sudden start making Hawaiian art and then a couple of years later we move and now we're in Korea and now I make Asian art I mean that's kind of I feel like that's no way for myself to live my life trying to yeah I, I don't know trying to make myself in that way fit so I'm, I always stay kind of true to myself so like all my books kind of relate to my childhood in a way that they're about animals or animal relationships or you're like I have uh, two books coming out with these gnomes that live in the woods and in Finnish culture gnomes are kind of the big part of that and and I always imagined these little gnomes living in the woods when I was little and so so in that sense I'm always kind of staying true to myself as far as my subject matter goes but then I think where I do get influenced by the moves is just I'm I've become very fast at networking wherever we go okay. you just either contact galleries or art organ like there's usually like an art what do they call them like an art league or an art guild mm -hmm. in like every town and and so I usually just figure out like who the art people are in town and I make friends with everybody and the children's book industry is just really loving and and they just welcome you with open arms no matter where we've gone. And so I just always make lots of friends. And then the great part is, you know, those friends will carry on through Facebook or other social media. And so I, I still keep up with all the friends I've made over the years mm -hmm. um, on social media. But I, I feel like it's those friends that you make along the way that kind of mold the way you think or the way you see the world because you know you're going back and forth with ideas and talking and, and making friends and and it just opens up just new ideas and 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 you know introduces you to different ideas and I think that's that's the, the people have maybe more molded my life you know people who have encouraged me to you know start picture book illustration or people who have given me a chance to you know do something that I didn't have a chance to do at the previous town like I organized like this big like a print fair with a steamroller and stuff like that when we were living in Texas and so so those are really kind of the the, the things that I cherish and and kind of what I've learned from over the years I think so it's important to be plugged into a community I feel like because it just it it enriches your life so much and and the great part is that nowadays a lot of those communities are online I have so many friends who I've never met face to face but like I feel like they have my back you know even though they're just people I've met online so you did mention that you travel a lot right and I was just curious because the pandemic started back in 2020 where were you at that point in 2020? Yes, in 2020. So we were in Hawaii in 2020. Okay. <laughs> so at the, at the height of the pandemic, because every it was so new for for all of us, right? It's all it's something that you know none of us have had has experience um, in this lifetime. But how has that? How has the pandemic affected your way of working in terms of creating art? Um, well, it was definitely challenging. Mm -hmm. uh, we, I actually ended up homeschooling two of our kids for one year that year, um, just because, you know, we were worried about kids going to school and, and everything. And actually the school just kind of like it was, I think it was like two weeks before school started and they had no idea what they were doing. And I, I was like, I, I cannot take this anymore. I just, 
we just need a plan. And so I decided that we were going to homeschool and we were just going to do it for as long as we needed to. And so we homeschooled one full, full year with the kids. And so that definitely took up a lot of my time because then kids were with me all the time. And the youngest one, um, she was going to a part-time daycare, I think like three, three, four days a week, just kind of during the school hour times. Um, and so during the pandemic, my work hours definitely were cut almost to non-existent, but I did manage to do, you know, a couple of hours during the day. And then I usually work maybe four or five hours at night when, after they went to sleep. And so like during, I would just kind of so the way that I kind of get work done, because, you know, and like you were saying earlier, like people always wonder, well, how can you be so prolific with like everything else that's going on in your life? And so the way that I feel like I'm able to be very efficient in working is I just kind of block my time. And so like when I'm creating classes, like I, you, you have, when you're working for yourself and not for somebody else, you have to make your own deadlines. And so I'll make my own deadline. Okay. Like at the end of this week or the end of this month, this has to be done. And so like I'll record a class and edit all the, and I'll work late nights if I have to, to like reach that goal. Um, and I'm very, I don't know, goal oriented. And like, I just make myself, I just make myself reach those goals, no matter kind of what it takes. And so then you're able to knock things out and then you're over with, and then you move on to the next project. And so so, you know, like the next thing I have on my plate right now is I, like, I just finished, you know, I uploaded a, another class and we have another one coming with Etcher. And the next thing is working on two dummies for the upcoming books in 2023. And so like, I have like given myself two weeks to work on one and it has to be done. And then I have given myself, you know, two weeks to work on one. And then that kind of has to be done. And then after that, I have that exhibition coming in Finland. And so I'm hoping that I have a month to, and then like, I have to create, you know, X amount of pieces for myself in that month. And so like, instead of, you know, waiting for that artistic inspiration to show up at the end of the, you know, whenever it, you know, it never does. And so it's just, you just need to like sit down and get to work and then it shows up. And so for me, it's just important to get in there and start working. And then, you know, either the inspiration comes or it doesn't, but the work gets done nonetheless. And I feel like I just love what I do so much that like, I don't, I don't, that like, I don't have any issues with that. It, it seems to work. This system works great for me and, and, and I'm able to get a lot of stuff done that way. I, I heard two points that you made um, with what you just shared, Erica. It's one is inspiration doesn't come. It never does, right? But all we have to do is to sit down and start working. And also at the same time, um, I heard that because it's what you love to do. And I guess we often hear that if, if it's something that you love, it doesn't feel like work at all. Um, you get the mm-hmm. multiple words, right? Uh, it's work at the same time. It's something that you're passionate about. And sorry, three points that I heard from what you just said. It's another one, all <laughs> setting. Um, this is something that a lot of people struggle with. I mean, when I talk about the pandemic earlier and hearing you talk about how you juggle everything, um, even though you have, you know, the time that you have to create and make art um, was reduced because of course you have to teach your, your kids and do homeschool, but you still find we're still able to find a time to create. And hearing you talk about it, wow, you're very good. Maybe you should teach um, time management as well, because that is something that a lot of people struggle with. And I guess it it all boils into what you just said, goal setting. Is do you have a like a, a technique or sort of a, a standard guidelines that you follow when it comes to goal setting. I know you, you touch on this a little bit, like a lot of a specific time or deadlines. Mm-hmm. How do you keep up with the deadlines? Is there any sort of, because t- I think that's also one thing that people would list out all their goals, right? And they would attach a deadline, but it's really the question of how do you keep up with those deadlines once you have the um. Well, I think it, there, like the goals is kind of, uh, I feel like it's a twofold twofold thing so like like first you have to like make kind of like your big lofty goals kind of like your five-year goal or your one-year goal 
And like when people used to talk about one year goal or five year goal or 10, like I, I used to think that was so silly. And like, I did not believe in like writing things down and I've had people laugh at me for saying that I have, you know, this is like my one year goal to get this done or two year goal. And so, but I didn't realize how important and how, if how powerful that was until, you know, maybe about three, four years ago or maybe, well, maybe three years ago. Um, I, you know, I re- wrote down the goals that I wanted to have, you know, tr- tr- like a children's book, like under contract and getting ready to be published. And I wanted to have a puzzle deal and I wanted to have a life. I can't remember what was on that list, but, you know, I had written all these kind of goals down that just seemed like so far out there. Like they did, like, I didn't know when I was going to reach them, but those were my goals because when you're just kind of working for yourself, like it's so easy to like see those shiny objects and like, Oh, like, and then like, then you start work doing artwork for that. Like I like, like I like to dabble in like fabric design. So like I have stuff on spoon flower and, and then it's like somebody got like a friend got a licensing deal for a fabric company. And that's, Oh my gosh, I want a licensing deal for a fabric company. And then I start make you know, then you start like doing stuff for that or somebody got a deal to make postcards and then, Oh my gosh, I want a postcard. And, and so it's so easy to like, like sway in the wind and you know never get anything done because you have so many things but when you like write those goals down and you know where like this is this is what is important for me then when like you know your friend gets that fabric deal or whatever then like I am so happy for you but you know like I need to like keep my it's kind of like this like I just have to like keep my eyes on the road and so when you write the goals down it really just helps you focus and so like if it's not on that goal sheet I'm not going to like waste my energy on it except for like if I have a little bit of extra time and I want to do something for fun like then I'll like dabble in that and post that on, you know, post a fabric pattern on spoon flower. But like, that is not like where I'm putting my efforts into. And so, so, so that's like goal setting. Number one is figuring out, like, just take that time, dream big, you know, whatever it is. And then from there you start, you know, breaking it down. And so, you know, in order for me to get the book deal, I actually had a book agent, um, literary agent, but I needed to actually break up with her and I needed to find another literary agent. Cause we, we just, pers- our personalities didn't match really well. And so, so I broke up with her and I made a whole bunch of work and, you know, new body of work and wrote several books. And then I, I signed with a new agent and then, you know, the agent pitches your work and then you make a book deal. And then, you know, the, then you, you know, make the book deal. And, and then at that point, now you have a deadline. And so now I have like a hard deadline of when my book has to be done. And so once you start, you know, making these deals or, you know, then you start working backwards, like from the deadline and figuring out like on your calendar, like where is everything going to go? And so, so I have like those lofty goals that are, you know, five years down the road or, you know, years or at least like six months. And then I have like the steps that I need to do right now. And so I'm still working towards like those five and 10 year goals, but like, I have to make sure that I'm also now, like, I'm now also bound by the, the current goals for book deadlines and, and like puzzled it. Like uh, I had, a, I finished another puzzle piece and then they asked me to do a third one. And so like, just knowing, and like, you know, maybe like the puzzle dead, like there's really no deadline. So I can just do that, like in between whatever. And so it really kind of makes it easier. And then I know my exhibition has, you know, it has to go up on this day and we travel to Finland on this day. So everything has to be done before this day. And so then it makes it very easy for you to figure out like what, what your dates are. And then you just kind of adjust your work effort, you know, according to that, I guess that kind of makes sense. I'm assuming it does make sense. And I guess I need to start organizing my life the way that you do (laughs) organize yours Uh, because yeah, you know, setting getting your list done is one thing, but breaking it down into some actionable items as to what you need to do to get to that point mm-hmm. is another thing. Mm-hmm. And abiding into that and getting that structure, that mm-hmm. outline, and yeah. keeps you aligned to your goals. That what you said earlier, the shiny, um, shiny objects and your objects. Or something, yeah. Um, that's very common because you you have these goals, and then you see someone else is having or reaching their other goals. 
and you start to think maybe I could also reach that goal or maybe I should shift it. so it becomes, what, when you're focused like what you said it makes yeah. it, it gives you aligned and focused on yeah. the goals that you set for yourself yeah. and I feel like that's that never goes away that's like the shiny object no matter kind of what point whether you're just starting out or you've already been doing it for a long time like that never goes away and so it's just and I was that person who kept chasing those. And I feel like that's like for the first 10, whatever years after college, I feel like I didn't really go anywhere because I was constantly doing this and then doing that. And, and granted we were moving. And so like, I was still trying to figure out like where I fit with the moving and moving around like 10 years ago is totally different than moving now because 10 years ago, like there was none of this online classes, online communities, online. There was a little bit, but it's nothing like it is today. So I feel like, you know, and, and that also like that, the point where everything kind of converged about five, six years ago, that was, I feel like when everything kind of tipped over and especially now with the pandemic, with everything being so open online. So I feel like I'm able to, <clears throat> I'm able to function like all my work stuff is just meeting people via zoom online, like with my agent or with editors or, you know, everything, everything just happens online. I don't have to be anywhere in person. Whereas where I was doing, except for the art show, when I was doing only art shows and back then I was only teaching in person. Like I had to, I had to like connect with all the galleries in person and, and figure out where the art centers are and like try to make a good impression so that, you know, when I actually get the art show two years later, we're actually like still living in town. And so like, it was a very different, it was a very different time, even 10 years ago to live and try to make ends meet as an artist compared to kind of where we are at right now. Absolutely agree with how everything has changed during the pandemic. And there are pros and cons, but in terms of connecting connectivity and still getting that engagement with other people online, I think that's one of the plus thing, one of the like things that we have learned to navigate through this whole pandemic, and especially with people from all around and as an artist and shifting from um, teaching on site to online is also a skill that everyone has to adapt. Now, speaking of mm -hmm. this, um, I know that you have done classes with us and there is an upcoming one. We don't have the schedule. We don't have the dates yet, but America here has already done the recording and we have a sample of what the mm -hmm. class is yep. going to be. So, okay. So if you're watching this from YouTube, then uh, you'll be able to see um, what America is showing. This is the art piece that she will be doing for the class that she's teaching with Etcher. We will definitely include the dates and the details on the show notes, but that is a beautiful art piece. And um, I'm sure you're going to share technique on how to create that. Um, it looks like it's straight out from an illustration, like a children's illustration book, like a mini story book. So for any one of you who wants to learn how to illustrate and draw, similar to what uh, Mirka showed us, um, if you're watching this from YouTube, then watch out for the details of her class um, in our show notes and um, on YouTube, so on Spotify and Apple. Um, Mirka, we're nearing the end of the episode, and um, thank you so much for sharing your journey with us. There's so many layers in, in this interview, and you know, for someone who's moved from one place to another, juggling between self and artists and an exhibition, uh, having an Etsy shop, managing your kids, and um, being able to teach at the same time, I think it all boils down to having your goals set, taking the time to really uh, determine what it is that you would want to focus on, because that way you will be able to focus your energy. So for anyone mm -hmm. who's starting out and probably is someone who doesn't know Okay, do I want to start with forests? Do I want to start with animals? There's so many things. There's so many uh, available resources out there. And sometimes it gets overwhelming. Um, what would be your pieces of advice or any golden nuggets that you can share um, with someone who is in that state of their creative um, or of their art journey? Um, I think one of the things, the same thing is with the goal setting is I think you just need to like turn the computer and turn your phone off and just 
take a moment to kind of center yourself and figure out what is it that you, you really want to do because it, the shiny objects, like there's so many and they're so beautiful and, 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 and everything just looks fun and exciting. And so, but if, if you just take time away from everything, you, you close everything down and you really think, do I, what is it that makes me excited about making art? Is it, you know, am I really excited about color or am I really excited about lines or am I really excited about animals or flow or whatever it might be like, figure out what is it that, that really excites you about art making and then kind of seek out the classes that support that. And I feel like that's, you know, a very sensible way to kind of go forwards and then, you know, kind of find the classes that really, really fit your needs rather than, you know, and then after you kind of, and then after you get your footing and you, you, you figure out what you like, then when you have extra time and you kind of figure things out for you already, then, you know, it's time to, Hey, like, let's try something out of the blue, some random class. And, and I mean, I'm still taking art classes myself and, and learning new techniques and cause it's just fun to throw something new in the mix. And, and you, and, and personally, I just really like listening to teachers and even if it's not like a technique that I'm going to take away from the class or, or, or something that I'm going to use in my work for picture book illustration or for art making, there's always something, you know, like a, a, a process or a technique or something that I can pick up from the teacher that, you know, something that's unique to them. And I always kind of enjoy finding that little, little thing from everybody who I take classes from. That's an excellent golden, excellent golden nuggets from me, Mirka. Um, I think you're absolutely right about shutting down your computer, turning off your phone, because sometimes it, it, it can be very overwhelming just looking at resources. And of course, searching for artists or works, mm -hmm. it's not a bad thing, but when you overwhelm yourself with a lot of things and it will leave you stop not wanting to start because there's just so many. Um, yeah. But yeah, that's an absolutely... Good advice, um, especially for someone who's starting out in their art journey. Marika, thank you so much for sharing your story with us. Um, we look forward well, thanks for having me. Yeah, for your class, your classes, and um, your exhibit that's happening in Finland, right? Um, sometime mm -hmm. in June. Uh, if you want to learn more about that, I'm sure it's going to be posted in your website, which is w. Oh. Yeah, www.mirka with an h at the end dot com. Okay, we'll include that as well in the in the show notes so you can check that out. But if you want to check out the classes, we'll also include that details in the show notes and on our blog post. So watch out for that. But thank, thank you so much. And if anybody has questions, feel free to tag me on the Etcher Facebook Facebook site or somewhere online. Absolutely. We'll also include her Instagram account so you can check it out as well. Thanks, Mirka, for being on the show. Take care. Thank you. Bye, Bye everybody. Bye. I am reevaluating my goals as we speak. Truly a refreshing episode for someone who might be feeling stuck or experiencing art block. Are you a fan of writing down your goals too? Well, let us know through the blog post associated with this podcast at etrolab.com slash America. We would love to hear your thoughts. So please drop us a five-star review on the Apple podcast or you can find us on YouTube at Etro Studio. And oh, hitting the subscribe button is greatly appreciated. Thank you so much for tuning in and we'll catch you again next time. Until then, let's make more art.